promised us that he would be a father and would love us with a love that would not cease. I tried him and I found his promises are true. He's everything he said that he would be. The finest words I know could not begin to tell just what Jesus means to me. Praises be to the Most High God. Once again, it's a joy, a truly a joy to be able to share something great, something rich, something spiritual out of heavenly places on Carrier of His Presence broadcast. My name is Elder Jesse Darrell, and I do appreciate you tuning in to the broadcast today. Usually, if you've been watching the broadcast lately, you know that Minister Diane Tasley and I have been co-hosting this broadcast, but she had another appointment for this month, and that appointment was, of course, this upcoming workshop, so, uh, so that she would not be overloaded she thought that she would take off this particular time and spend some time, spend the necessary time that she would need to uh, work on the last minute connections. But nonetheless, we've been talking about the battle of the mind. This, I tell you, even though we've been on this for some time, you never can get enough information about the battle that has been lodged against the mind. Because if the enemy can get the mind, then he has the rest of us, obviously. So for the people of God, something that really, really blessed me this week as I prepared for the broadcast, asking heaven, what in the world am I supposed to say? Because truly, Minister Tasley is my help, and I feel such a strength that I draw from her when she joins me. So I was really, really talking to the Lord, what am I going to talk about specifically? And I had picked up this book, Since the Battle is the Mind, I just like to read warfare material. I'm a warrior for Jesus, and I love being one. And this book by Sidney Trim, Command Your Morning. And this lady has so many little nuggets uh, that she has written in this book that I was reading, especially between pages 23 to through 26. And something that just really, really stood out in my mind is how meditation stimulates the imagination. I need to say that again because I hope it did something for you like it did for me. Meditation. Meditation stimulates the imagination. So what I did was I got my Strong's Concordance and I got a few little additional synonymous terms for meditation. It means to reflect. A lot of us are more familiar with the term muttering to ourselves. Uh, but something that really blessed me was repeat softly and quietly while abandoning outside abstractions. Wow. Repeat softly and quietly while abandoning outside distractions. Outside distractions. There are times in our life where the challenge is so great and the battle against the mind is so fierce that we have to softly remind ourselves, God is my light and my salvation. I have nothing to fear that the Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? And we don't have to get real deep. We don't have to get spiritual. We can just stick with that particular uh, uh, scripture all day long, often just muttering to ourselves, just softly as we go about our day. That's meditation. And from that, if we live a life, glory be to God, of meditation, it just really, really, really stimulates the imagination to where whatever the challenge is that is before us, we just see ourselves winning. 
We see ourselves walking in authority. We see ourselves empowered because of the word of God that we're just constantly, softly muttering, repeating to ourselves. Another definition that I really enjoy about the word meditation is getting lost in communion with God. Wow. Getting lost in communion with God. Communion, fellowship, brotherhood, koinonia, they're all interchangeable terms for communion. Brotherhood, fellowship, communion, koinonia. So I'm just lost in that brotherhood, that fellowship that we can have with the Lord because I am meditating. I am muttering to myself over and over and over whatever it is that I need to get through this day and get through this day where God is glorified and the problem is not magnified before me. Another scripture that really, really uh, stood out more than anything was Joshua. And I want to read that first chapter of Joshua because when I think about meditation, many, many years ago, I studied the book of Joshua. And it just, it, the, the power, the winning, the might, the obedience, the, the honoring of the Lord that Joshua did has always been such a witness to me personally. And it helps me with the call that is upon my life. So what I did was I wrote out Joshua, the first chapter, verses 8 through 9. And I just want you to listen. I'm going to stop periodically because that's my method of teaching, not just reading the scripture and hope that you're going to understand it. But I like to read a little, discuss it so that your so that your mind can be enlightened as to what the Lord is saying to me and hopefully what he'll be saying to you as you get revelation. Joshua chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. So this book of the law, of course, we know was the first five books, this book of the law, in other words, the Pentateuch that Moses wrote. He said, look, this shall not depart from your, from your mouth. This is the, the scriptures that Israel would just meditate. They would know the first five books of the Bible. And he said, just meditate on that over and over and over. Just mutter to yourself. Repeat softly. Re repeat quietly to yourself. Getting lost in communion with God. So you shall do this day and night that you may observe to do all that is written therein. Now we said all oh, now. That, that don't mean that there's some stipulations there in a little fine print. When he said that you should observe to do all that is written, the challenge for the church now is that we know what to do. The thing is for us to get up out of ourselves, put self on the back burner, put the Lord in the forefront, and do what we know the Lord would have us to do. And it's going to come through meditation. Then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So I'm looking at this and I said, wow, I can see whether it's spiritually, whether it's emotionally, whether it's financially, our key to prosperity and success is meditation because from meditation, it stimulates our imagination. I don't know where people like uh, Bill Gates, uh, the gentleman that was, came up with the idea for Apple uh, Jobs, I can't think of his first name. But all of these people had phenomenal ideas uh, how to do this, how to do that, not status quo thinking. Well, what more for the church who's filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, I can't say that they were not, but I'm saying how much more when we are led by the Spirit of God that we begin to meditate on his word and allow that meditation to stimulate our imagination. I could never have imagined my husband and I, for an example, being over a ministry. What I could imagine myself doing was teaching the people of God, 
Teaching is my heart. Teaching is my passion. I love knowledge. I love for other people to know. But I never could have imagined the Lord trusting us enough to be in charge of his people for a season in our lives. So it's like this meditation. I, I enjoy meditating, meditating, that communion with God, that just getting lost, glory be to God, in my communion with God and repeating softly God's word over and over and abandoning outside distractions. And from that, I have learned to be more disciplined, more temperate, uh, speaking softly, thinking before I speak, knowing that when things are not going right in my heart, knowing to be quiet, glory be to God, it's like all of that comes through meditation. And the same thing with Joshua, if you think about it, because the Lord was talking specifically to Joshua when he said, meditate day and night, and then you shall have success. You will have good success. You will prosper, but you have to do all that I'm commanding you to do. Look at the life of Joshua. I am just astounded when in victory, after victory, after victory, after victory. And most of you are familiar with the only battle that Joshua really lost was the battle of AI. And one of the things that always stuck, stood out in my mind when he lost that battle, the first thing that he did was, was rent his clothes. That was a sign of mourning and anguish. And he lay prostrate before the Ark of the Covenant. Well, today we don't have an Ark of the Covenant because the Holy Ghost resides in the Christian. But what we learn from that, of course, is what to do. We immediately seek God because the Lord said, look, and nobody's going to be able to stand before you all the days of your life. He said, I am going to be with you. And I would imagine with Joshua meditating on God's word, Lord, how can this be? How can I obey you? How can I obey you? How can I meditate on your word? And how can we lose this battle? I'm the one that's in charge. I'm the one that's leading your people at this point. And so the Lord showed him. I feel that any time we appear to be losing, one of the first things that we do is get into that position to where we can hear clearly what the Lord is saying. And so obviously the Joshua did find out what had happened, that there was sin in the camp, and he dealt with it. He dealt with the sin that was in the camp. We have to deal with the sin in the camp if we're going to observe to do all that the Lord has commanded us to do. Something else I did too, I looked up the word command. The word command is an order, an authoritative order. Someone coming from someone greater than ourselves. Um, I remember my father being a soldier. A lot of times we may be someplace three months and dad would come in and he'd say, babe, I got my orders. And sometimes she would say, oh, not again. In other words, we got to move again. Uh, but it wasn't a question of, well, no, we're not going to do it. No, we're not going to go. It's like, I really don't want to, but there's no question as to whether or not I will. It's the same thing with the word of God. The Lord have commanded some things. His authoritative orders have gone forth in certain ways in our lives. And that is for us to observe, to do all that he have ordered us to do. So it's not a question of, will I do it? There's a little uh, discomfort maybe, but you know it's a place that we need to be uh, because the battle is against the mind. And that's how the enemy creates strongholds if we do not pull down our imaginations and bring our thoughts into captivity and obedience. Some thought to say, well, maybe I can do this a little different than what the Lord requires. So we have to pull that thought down, amen? and to do what the Lord have commanded us to do. Then continuing in Joshua, the first chapter, he says, have I not commanded you? So command you, be strong 
and of a good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Have I not commanded you to be strong and of a good courage? The Lord have commanded us to be strong and of a good courage. Because if there's ever a time in church history where we need to be strong and of a good courage, it is now because of the temptations and the struggles and the battle that rages against the mind. We have to have a mind and a heart to obey the Lord and do what he has said to do. So some of the excerpts that I've taken from that book, Command Your Morning, I thought this right here was so beautiful. All that you achieve or fail to achieve is a direct result of your meditation and imagination. All that you achieve or fail to achieve. Think about all of the times that you lost, all of the times you thought you were right and you was wrong, all the times you messed up and missed the mark. It's like what comes out of our meditation and that obedient spirit will determine whether or not we fail or whether or not we achieve whatever it is that we desire to achieve. Something else that Sidney uh, Trim stated was, you are the architect of your life. An architect not only designs a building or designs, they also oversee, they also supervise to make sure that what they have designed is laid out according to their specifications. And isn't that something, isn't that beautiful to know that we are the architect of our life, that I can blame someone for not succeeding, and I can get angry with someone because I'm not where maybe I think I should be, but I have a news alert for you. You are the architect of your life. You're the one that is designing it. You're the one who's given the responsibility to oversee what you're designing. So I just thought this was so special, so powerful, especially when we realize that battle is against the mind. And if we're not strong, if we're not determined, if we're not steadfast in our spirit, we're going to find somebody to blame because we are not as successful in life as we would like to be. Something else that I thought would be interesting. When thoughts of prosperity dominate your imagination, your choices will be directed towards building a life on earth consistent with God's architectural design for your life. When thoughts of prosperity dominate your imagination. You know, one of these days I'm going to come on here and say, you know what? The Lord did it. I'm a millionaire. Remember, I've been saying for a long time, I'm going to be rich one day. I have no idea where it's going to come from. And come on, let's not get real deep. Now, I'm not talking about spiritually. I know I am deep. I, mean, I am rich spiritually. I cannot call it superpowers and tell them that I'm rich spiritually, so therefore my faith is going to pay the bill. Uh, you already know the other end of that story. What's going to happen if I don't pay the bill? So we need to keep spiritual things spiritual and earthly things earthly. I need money to pay my utility bill. And I've just been believing, believing the Lord for many, many years that one day I am going to be prosperous financially. And you know, it's not just to heap upon myself more to build greater barns. I want to be wealthy so that I can help others. I want to enjoy it too now. Come on now, I'm not that deep. There's a little Jesse left in me. But I want to be able to help others. And so I am looking forward to being rich. So one of these days, I'm going to come on the broadcast and I'm going to say, I am rich. And it's because that's what I've been meditating on. I just don't look at the way things are today. I look at what I believe my imagination is going to bring me. I keep it fertile. I try to keep it rich. I meditate on God's word. And I believe that what I desire for myself Hopefully it is his desire. So don't let it be a surprise to you when I come on the broadcast one day and say, the Lord did it. He blessed me. Amen. Something else that I thought was, uh, was a good nugget. Knowledge is important. 
But imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited, but imagination is boundless through meditation. Knowledge is limited, but imagination is boundless through meditation. So just think, I mean, how we spend time in the presence of God and allow what we're meditating on take us further and further and further into the realms of the spirit. There's no telling what ideas we're going to come up with, what brand new uh, uh, inventions that we're going to come up with because we are meditating on God's word. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Joshua was confident after he left the presence of God and had that encounter with the Lord and the Lord said to be strong and of a good courage. He said, I'm commanding you to be strong and of a good courage. That wherever your feet tread upon, that's going to be yours. He said, I'm not going to leave you and I'm not going to forsake you. And I remember when he stood before this, uh, uh, really it was the pre-incarnate Christ. And, and it was a captain of the Lord's army had pulled his sword. And Joshua wanted to know, I mean, come on now. He's bold. He's mighty. He said, are you friend or foe? And the Lord said, well, I'm captain of the Lord's army. He said, you know, this ground, you standing on his holy ground. The point that I'm getting to is that he was fearless. And that's where the church has got to be today. That we have to be a fearless people. I'm not saying going looking for trouble. Don't misunderstand me. But right is right. Wrong is wrong. There's a battle raging against the mind to get us to compromise. And we need to stand on the principles of God. And to stand fast in what we believe the Lord desires us to do couple of other things before we close today. Through imagination, some only see defeat, disappointments, and disempowerment. So we need to be more proactive. Through imagination, some see defeat, they, they see disappointments. And it's not to say that what we see is not real, but that's why being proactive, to me, meditating on God's word throughout the day is a proactive position so that when the challenges come or the challenge is there and it becomes greater, that right off, you know, God is my light and my salvation. I have nothing to fear. Today, I need to be swift to hear, slow to wrath, and slow to anger. So whatever that meditation is, find a focus and enjoy the communion with God because the imagination can see that. But meditation, when meditation is inferior or undisciplined, the foundation is laid for potential defeat. However, through meditating on God's word day and night, we prophesy victories and empower the imagination for daily living. I prophesy to myself, I can do whatever it is the Lord has put my hands to do. And I do it through the power of God because he strengthens me. I know how to be abased. I know how to be, how to abound. I know how to be in want. And I know how to have plenty. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I can do all things through Christ. Sometimes I have to meditate on that all day long until I get to a place to where I feel it. I am confident in it. And my imagination takes me to a place of joy and comfort and excitement. Amen. So both faith and miracles testify that what can be imagined already exists in the realm of the spirit. Just think about it. Joshua didn't know that he could conquer Jericho, but his imagination took him to a place of faith and miracles. So after meditating on God's word, there was nothing at all that prevented him from believing that he was able to conquer his Jericho's through the power of God. Well, 
I just wanted to share that one nugget with you before we end the broadcast today. Um, remember, meditation is one of the weapons of our warfare. Meditation will stimulate our imaginations and take us to wonderful, glorious places for us to be able to enjoy the Lord. I wish you remember that we are a carrier of God's presence. It is up to you and it is up to me to restore the image of Christ upon the earth. Remember, use your weapons. You have many weapons the Lord have given you and meditation is one of them. Meditate on Joshua, the first chapter. It's a powerful, powerful chapter. So you be blessed in Jesus. Remember the underwriters of this broadcast. I'm so appreciative of my brother, Johnny Pearson, Minister Tasley, my husband, Freddie Darrow, and Paul Herring. I appreciate them so much for all of the encouragements that they offer. So you be blessed in Jesus, and hopefully you will stay mindful of who you are in Jesus Christ. He promised us that he would be a father. And would love us with a love that would not cease. I tried him and I found his promises are true. He's everything he said that he would be. The finest words I know could not begin to tell just what Jesus means to me. For he's more wonderful than my mind can conceive. And my heart can believe He goes beyond My highest hopes and fondest dreams He's everything that my soul And so much more, more than amazing, more than marvelous, more miraculous could ever be. He's more than wonderful. That's what Jesus is. To me. I stand amazed to think the King of glory would come to live within the heart of man. I marvel just to know that he loves